about holistic SEO and Drupal 8. Uh, best practices in an ever-changing search landscape. Uh, I have the slides online. Uh, you can follow along or check out them out later. Uh, it's at jimbir.ch slash holistic dash SEO. Um, chocked filled with links to everything I'm going to talk about and you know most of the stuff is all uh, reference material online. Uh, so yeah, please follow along or check that out later. Uh, I'm a strategist at Xenomedia in Chicago uh, and you can follow me online at, at the Jim Birch. Just about anywhere. Okay, so what is holistic SEO? Uh, it's a term used to describe development uh, and content production in which content marketing, technical SEO, performance, security, user experience, and user intent all come together to create an ideal URL on the internet about a certain topic. Uh, so like basically everything that goes into that one URL, that one page online. Why take a holistic approach? Um, because you know, using these systems, you know, following along what's going on in the search world, uh, defines a repeatable set of best practices uh, that we can follow developing other sites. Uh, it ultimately benefits the user, you know, which is what we're trying to do. You know, create sites for our users to come visit. Um, as search algorithms get more and more complex and you know we already have the idea of machine learning involved the next step after that is artificial intelligence um, this big massive data you know is creating these algorithms that return results based on our words in our location and what device we're searching on um, as this gets more and more complex we're not going to be able to control or predict any changes that you know Google Facebook uh, YouTube, these search engines do. So we just got to, you know, kind of come up with the best practices, follow them, you know, get 80% of the way there, uh, skip all the tricks and games that people play. Um, so I put this presentation together uh, for the audience of content creators. Um, we're going to show you how to research, create, analyze, and then report and refine. And then developers um, plan build and test afterwards. So who are the search engines? These are the biggest seven search engines in the world. Google, YouTube, Amazon, Facebook, Bing, Badu, and Yandex. Um, basically, they are web search engines. Uh, Google, that has 75% of the global search market. Bing, which has 9% of the global search, but claims 33% of the US search market since uh, Yahoo, Bing, and AOL all came together. Uh, Baidu has 82% market share in, in China, bigger than Google, just massive. And Yandex has more than 50% market share in Russia. Uh, they used to have more, they're falling a little bit behind. Platform specific search engines, uh, YouTube, Amazon, and Facebook, these are the three biggest ones. Um, People are optimizing content for these search engines just like we are optimizing our pages for the web. So if you're a content creator and you want to rank your videos on YouTube, there is SEO uh, approaches to do that. You know, it's similar to what we do. Number of views, links to it, uh, titles and descriptions and tags. Um, if there is a search engine, people are optimizing for it. So if this is part of your job, you know, you can go ahead and, and take some of these ideas that we're going to talk about and apply it to your content there. The scale of search. Last year, two years ago, a year and a half ago, in May of 2016, a Google administrator revealed that users make at least two trillion searches per year. Um, this is the first time they talked about it since 2011. They don't let these numbers go, but every once in a while they'll come out and say, oh yeah, we got trillions of searches. Um, that's 167 billion a month, 5.5 billion a day, 200 million an hour, 3.8 million a minute, like 63,000 searches per second. 
Like this is just massive, like beyond anything I could ever think about, at least. You know, so they said we have trillions. Could mean they have two and a half, three, who knows? They won't talk about it. They haven't talked about it since. Maybe they'll talk about it when they get to a uh, million or whatever comes after. When they get to Google Plex. Google Plex a million. <laughs> um, there are people doing analysis on these searches, though. Uh, Moz, which is one of uh, kind of like a, a SEO company that uh, rose to the top. Um, they have great tools and a great community surrounding them. Um, and they produce really good content about uh, SEO. Um, Rand Fishkin, the CEO, just came out a blog post using uh, aggregated data from a company called JumpShot that estimated US searches alone on Google are well over 40 billion a month, which would put the US searches alone at half a trillion uh, plus or minus uh, per year. Uh, which actually would show a little increase in the numbers they came out with in 2016. Um, here's the chart. Uh, click through and uh, check out the blog post. Uh, really good stuff. Basically, they're analyzing is the SEO opportunity growing or shrinking? So if searches are increasing, but Google is always changing the search results. Uh, and how can you work in SEO world in a moving environment? It's a really good blog post. Um, so now we'll get into some search basics. There are three types of searches. There are, every search you can narrow down to these three things. Navigational. The searcher wants to go somewhere, you know, whether that be an online property, I want to go to Disney.com, or I want to go to the Friend Center at Princeton University. Informational. The searcher wants to learn something. Um, and then transactional. The searcher wants to buy, sell, sign up. The searcher wants to actually do something, make a transaction online. So once upon a time, you know, in my early days online, we could make a page on the internet and submit it to Google and our sitemap, and then bang, any word on that page, we could, you know, show up. It's still in effect if you make up your own words, you can find your <laughs> words online. Um, there it is. Um, but these days, uh, individual pieces of content can be returned for searches that don't even have to have the word in them. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple examples about these pages that are being returned for terms uh, and like about these pages in general. So this uh, page right here, uh, House Logic, it's a realtors.com information site. Um, just messing around and found out that this article got returned for a whole bunch of different searches. So, Guide to Hardwood Floor Finishes. Um, it's listed for hardwood floor finishes. Great, that was their topic, their key keyword. Uh, wood floor finish. So, uh, slightly different uh, wording, returns. How to finish a hardwood floor and wood floor finishing. Um, you know, you'll see that these have different intent, these last two. Um, so it's a well-written article uh, from a valuable domain and uh, has a lot of links to it, external links. Um, the article itself has a nice big image. It is a long form piece. It has over a thousand words. Uh, it has really good meta tags and JSON LD markup, uh, which is JavaScript object notation for linked data, basically meta tags on steroids. Um, it's a very fast loading, uh, it's responsive, and has a bunch of other nice features. So, uh, bang, popped right to the top of our search. Um, this is an information search, hardwood floor finishes. You know, Google presents me with a bunch of information pages, um, some images of hardwood floor finishes, uh, and of course a whole bunch of ads. Um, there's some transactional elements, so the shopping box off to the right. So. You know, there is an odd chance that if I search car, I do want to buy a car today. But usually I want to find out some information first. Um, and then we have basically similar results for wood floor finish, but for some reason Google put the shopping block, block first. 
Um, so maybe people who searched this did actually go out and buy a car the day they decided they wanted a car, which happens, right? Um, so how to finish a hardwood floor. This is definitely my wording, how to, definitely says I want to learn about this. It makes it an informational search. Um, the knowledge bo uh, block at the top is links to a how-to article, how to finish a hardwood floor. Um, the rest of it is all how-tos. There's a video block. Um, and then the knowledge block is actually from the same site as ours. Uh, so it's not a how-to, it's a product guide, but it's related to the topic that uh, this well, the whole thing is in, how to finish a hardwood floor. If you're finishing a hardwood floor, you would want hardwood floor finish. And then wood floor finishing. This is the act of finishing a hardwood floor. Um, it definitely is a transactional search. Uh, Google shows me a big map block of businesses near me. Um, the listings are Yelp Business Reviews, Home Advisor, and other sites that aggregate businesses. Um, and then a couple of contractor websites. Um, this page, Hard to Floor Finishes, does, definitely doesn't fit in here, but Google thinks it's relevant to the topic. Like maybe I should know about Hard to Floor Finishes if I'm gonna hire somebody to finish my floor. Um, I spoke at Drupal Camp Iceland last year, which was pretty awesome, you know, because it was in Iceland. Um, but I could not figure out their language at all, so I searched for a record victory, victory for coffee, and you know I did not even need to come close. And Google brought me a map of all the coffee shops near me. So you know we don't need to know how to spell anymore. Just get close. Um, again, this is another semantic example. Uh, Lil Bub, he's my favorite internet cat. Uh, his or her name is L I L B U B. Um, so I searched for Little Bub Fireplace, and my favorite video around Christmas time of Little Bub sitting in front of the Yuletide blog. Um, little or fireplace aren't on the page or in the video at all, yet Google knew exactly what I was looking for. Um, Wedding dresses. You know, there's a lot of topic or a lot of talk about this long form articles, like that first uh, hardwood floor piece. Like it was a great piece for the search terms that it, it returns. Um, but if I'm searching for wedding dresses online, uh, because I have a client who sells wedding dresses, not my own personal search, um, we get uh, ads, of course, local ads, sidebar ads, all the ads. Um, and then we get a whole bunch of category listings of wedding dresses. We're not getting the history of wedding dresses, what makes a wedding dress, how many different kinds of wedding dresses are there. Like, this doesn't fit into the long form piece. Um, you know, this is the page, you know, most of the pages that get returned look like this. Um, so that has to do with doing your research about your topics you're going after. Um, so you can put your keywords into Google, find out what's being returned for your topic, and then you can start coming up with a plan to make these uh, pages, make these websites. So, see if this will break your recording. Um, Google is topic-based. Uh, it returns content that's related but not necessarily specific to the search term. Um, so you no longer have to have a page about every keyword you want to rank for. Um, Google semantic, it understands synonyms, pluralities, misspellings, homonyms, and all those awesome words from fifth grade English. And it's focused on user intent, uh, what the user is trying to achieve. That's Google's biggest goal in the last few years and probably moving forward. They want to answer your questions. They want to help you do what you want to do. Um, so let's dig in. Okay, the search engine's results page, often called SERPs. Um, 
we're going to go through the anatomy of the SERP and then the anatomy of a search result. So the anatomy of a SERP. The first thing you're going to get is ads. Four, three, 12. It's up to Google. They do it different on every search term. Uh, the next thing that's usually shown now is search features. Um, so this is Google pulling content and featuring it on their website. Um, to get search features is the goal of all modern SEOs because it's like they say ranking zero. It's above the search results. If you can get this, you can show that you are the topic expert and you will, you know, chances are either answer the person's question and get that brand awareness for your clients or you get the click because people want to read more. <coughs> Below the features is the list of results. And you know, as we know, you want to be in the top two or three or nobody clicks your stuff ever. Um, and then at the bottom, you get related searches. So this is where your topic bubble starts to come in. So if I search for Drupal development, I start to see the spokes that come around my keyword and um, I can start to write about that in my articles or my content plan. Start to write about Drupal development companies, salaries, tutorials, development skills. Um, you know, looking at the actual results and looking at the related searches is a uh, big, big thing to do. Uh, each result in the search engine listings. You have a title, um, you have a URL underneath it in green. If you have your breadcrumbs marked up semantically uh, using schema.org, you will get to show structure in there. So you'll notice uh, one of my clients here, Zoom Data, um, they have their careers is under their company page. So you get in a little extra green in your search results. And then the description. Google will also show you similar sites. So if you click that little down arrow next to company or next to the URL, uh, you can see Google's cache, uh, what the page used to look like. and similar uh, sites, or at least in their opinion, similar sites. Um, if you do some more advanced uh, schema layout uh, using site links and site search uh, defining these things, or you're a big enough site where they do it for you, um, you can have an even bigger spread in Google's search results. So if you define your search, you can have a search box. If you um, map out your navigation correctly, they will give you a few other site links in the results. Um, so more of the search features and the featured snippets. Um, again, with additional JSON-LD markup, uh, you can get these featured snippets in the search features. This uh, first one, the Google logo on the right, um, you know, that usually appears on the right knowledge box. Um, the events listing, you know, if you list events on your site, Google can aggregate that to uh, another way that Google's trying to supply, you know, their users with answers faster. Um, so Google is documenting all of this. Here's the big list, breadcrumbs, corporate contacts, carousels of articles, logos and site links, job postings, recipes. Um, they are documenting in their search gallery, search feature gallery, um, all of the features that they're including in search, and they have created guides for you to mark up your content to acquire them. So I'm sure every company, university, everybody we work for has a so social profile. Um, you know, site links is always good. Most sites have searches, logos. Um, you definitely want to at least have some schema markup. And then based on your content types that you make, which is perfect for Drupal, um, you can mark up articles, books, courses, events, job sites, fact checked. Yeah, hopefully the internet gets a little bit more of that. Um, <clears throat> local businesses, music, occupations, podcasts, products, list goes on and on. Um, so this is a really good page to dig into if you are putting content on the internet. 
So how to rank for those features? Just said one, the schema.org markup, um, and how to check out that feature gallery to do it. I'm including also, uh, coming after this, featured snippets. Um, so the snippets are a little bit different. They are Google just deciding to pull your content out. They are you know, semantically reading your content and deciding that this is the answer to that question. Um, so you notice the keywords get bold that I searches for, Drupal developer, which is a fragment of development, um, developers. Um, this page on befused.com probably has a lot of links and a lot of age and you know good writing here. Um, you notice right below it for these feature snippets, they have additional uh, questions to answer. You know, this would if I wanted to capture this term, I would start researching those and seeing if I could answer those questions. What is Drupal programming language? I don't know. I'd research that. <laughs> um, so you'd need to do your topic research, get all your keywords in one post, um, write copy that answers the question. So instead of uh, writing, you know, that you know everything, you know, think about the, the questions that people are going to answer and write to that. Um, and then the best thing for uh, feature snippets is semantic HTML. It's ordered, unordered lists, tables of data, like HTML tables, and uh, paragraphs. So using you know, your good old HTML roots is actually the best thing for feature snippets. Um, Danny Sullivan, a uh, former reporter with Search Engine Land, uh, retired from that and actually just started as being a uh, uh, go-between between Google and SEOs. He just wrote a really great long-form piece on Google's blog, The Keyword. Um, a reintroduction to Google's featured snippets, um, which is a really, really good information piece. And then uh, this piece on SEM Rush, they did a lot of analyzation on last year on what kind of content was ranking for featured snippets and published a nice big infographic piece. Um, you know, of course, their benefit is to try to get you to sign up for their service, but there's a lot of good information in there too. Okay, so. That is like everything I know about everything. So let's get into the search engine ranking factors and how we can start implementing them in Drupal. Um, so search engine ranking factors are on and off site items that search engines use to evaluate uh, web properties placement in the search results for a certain query. So basically, this is the list of things that they are judging you and me upon. Um, each search engine has their own algorithm how they rank these uh, factors. Uh, on occasion, Google will publish factors. And when they do, get ready, because they're going to change search. So this big list, all of these blog posts run uh, Google Webmaster Central blog. And every single one of them changed the face of the internet. Mobile get, they said, we're going to rank pages that have mobile responsive sites higher than pages that don't. You know, the world wasn't responsive. Uh, page speed, same thing. HTTPS, they said we're gonna rank pages that use HTTPS more than HTTP. You know, most of the internet went HTTPS within a year. Um, amped results in search, uh, schema markup, the first time they talked about it was reviews, uh, recipes, and then uh, rich cards, which are the articles at the top that look nice and get your images in there. Amped. Amped. Amped, yes. What is it? Uh, accelerated mobile pages. So Google came up with a language of their own. Instead of a responsive website, they said, here, use this language. It, it's a really restrictive language, so pages fire really fast. Um, and then the latest one was that Google has developed a separate mobile index. Um, so for all of the time since Google started, they had one index where you would search. Now they have a mobile index where if you're on a phone or a tablet, you're going to be searching this index and another one that is for desktop. If they deem your site not acceptable for mobile, you won't even be in the possibility of getting indexed 
and being returned for people who are searching on their phone. Um, so it's to make sure that you either have a responsive site that loads fast, or you have something like AMP um, serving those pages up. And then the most important change that's happened in the last few years is that ranking factors can be organized differently for every single search term. So like I searched for hardwood floor finish, I got these nice long articles explaining everything I needed to know about hardwood floor finish. Um, definitely an emphasis on words and, and you know that topic that I wanted to learn about. But I'm searching for wedding dresses, words have no factor at all in there. If I have wedding dresses on the page, it's a you know, it's the the H1. Then everything else is listings of products. Um, so all of these factors that we're going to dive into depends on the search term, it depends on the searcher, it depends where I'm searching from, and then they'll reorganize these ranking factors. There are possibly 200. Uh, here's three articles at the bottom that I'll talk about the 200. Some of them are true, some of them are false, some of them are speculation, um, but these are all things that people have noticed that Google does. Um, who are the people? Uh, Backlinko, a uh, guy who writes really good, uh, he's an SEO company, he writes really good articles, he's kept the search engine ranking factor list going for at least five years. Uh, search Engine Land is a online magazine or publication, I'm not sure what the right word for it is anymore, uh, but they monitor what goes on in search. Uh, search Metrics, uh, this is a client of mine, they make uh, SEO software um, and they analyze uh, search rankings from around the world and blog about them. Uh, I mentioned Moz earlier, same thing. They make search SEO products and basically they are you know, researching and writing you know, content pieces about search. Um, here's a link to that Backlinko piece. Some are proven, some are controversial, other are SEO nerd speculation, but everything's in that big list. Um, my favorite piece uh, which breaks down the important ranking factors. Uh, there's about 35 and maybe half a dozen of those are negative ranking factors. Um, but Search Engine Land made these ranking factors into a periodic table of SEO success factors. Kind of breaks it down into something like a client can understand you know, what we're attacking, what we're going after. Um, so we use this to go through you know, the important stuff. Uh, Search metrics uh, for the early 2010s uh, up until 2016 came out with a large in-depth ranking factor report every year. Um, 2016 was the last time they did it. After that, uh, in their research, they noticed that they could break down these ranking factors by industry. Um, so travel, e-commerce, finance, health, and media, if you're in these big industries, um, they broke out their reports differently. So you know, those are your, not only your topic, but maybe your gigantic funnel of your industry. You can get some more insight there. Um, Moz in 2015 and 2013 published uh, their expert survey and correlation report. Um, like super nerdy data math stuff. Um, they haven't done it for 2017 yet, um, but basically they survey all of their users, you know, their, their customers, about what they see in search and publish that. Um, okay, uh, also Search Engine Land in 2016 was interviewing uh, one of the uh, T Google spam team or Google search team, Andre Lipat. Um, sorry, he stated that the top three ranking factors are links, content, and rank brain. Um, those are the top three ranking signals in Google search algorithms. Um, we'll get to links and content in a minute, but when he said this, rank brain was a new term that had come out. Uh, Google built their business on something called PageRank. Does everybody remember that? Um, it was basically the links of the internet. They could figure out, you know, if 
10 people link to this post, it's more important than a post that uh, nine people link to. Um, and this is how they made uh, you know, a Google zillion dollars. Um, so Rank Brain is their new algorithm. Uh, it's a machine learning artificial, artificial intelligence system. Um, so now, if Rank Brain sees a word or phrase that we enter into the search engine, it can guess as to what word or phrases have similar meanings and then give a res result back. So basically, Google can now better handle uh, searches that it's never seen before and make educated guesses. Once it does this, um, it gets reviewed by a human and then entered into the algorithm or not. Um, but this is the first step in this machine learning artificial, artificial intelligence world. Um, and then here's a dozen articles where you can read more about it. Um, they're always evolving and Google doesn't tell us anything at all or you know, little bits. Uh, so it's good to read up on this kind of stuff. So let's get into implementing all of these things in Drupal 8. Um, Mainly, a lot of these things can be implemented anywhere, but I'm going to have a special you know, Drupal attention here. Um, so here's our seven categories from that periodic table. We're going to talk about on-site and off-site, and then content architecture in HTML on the content side. You know, this is what we what Drupal is great for. Um, and then I'll go through the big list of off-site, and then talk about some tools you can use at the end, and then I think we can go party. So for content, when we talk about content, uh, Google wants to see quality writing. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? Google can now figure it out. You know, Basically, there's all these analysis tools where you can run your content through it and not only see is it good writing, but is it you know topic specific. Uh, keyword research. Are you writing using enough of the keywords and then other words in that topic bucket that your searchers are looking for? Uh, freshness. Is your content new or been updated recently? Google knows. They save everything. They search everything. Uh, so one of the biggest things you can do when you're looking at an old site is go and look at uh, what they call stale content. Like anything that's old or thin, can this be three articles you know merged into one you know should this article just go away uh, you have a limited crawl budget which is when Google spiders come to your site you know they go and pepper through your your site you don't want to waste that on stuff that'll never rank you know so a lot of SEOs will come and do an audit and say let's get rid of this whole section there's 300,000 URLs in your site that nobody's ever visited, nobody needs. You know, let's kind of work that back into something that's good. Uh, are there images, videos, news, uh, anything else related to that content or vertical, uh, vertical your, your topic? Um, does this page, this URL, give any other value besides words? So like the you know, wedding dress has a lot of value to somebody looking for a wedding dress even though it doesn't have those words. And then does the content answer questions? Uh, negative factor. So there's one negative factor in this bucket. Is the content thin? Does the content lack substance? Yeah. Let's get rid of it. The biggest thing and that's overlooked from a lot of people and a lot of sites is that a third of all searches in Google are for images. Um, and 12.5% of all search results have an image block in there. So that's that first feature down, it's going to have five or six images across. Um, you know, if you're not marking up your images properly, you're missing out. Um, so Drupal Core has the responsive image module built in. You know, not only do you want to have a good file name for your image, but you also want to have optimized images. So, um, you know, definitely if you haven't learned responsive images, check it out. Um, Drupal 8 makes it incredibly easy to require alt text on all your images. Not only is this good for accessibility and for people with screen readers, but it is also good for SEO. 
you can describe what's in this image. Don't stuff it with keywords, just use it as it's meant to be used and you'll benefit. Um, file name is also good. You know, if you upload a picture that says screenshot 2018 02 97 blah 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 blah, you know, that tells me nothing but the file name of the actual image. If the keywords are in there, it's, been a, it's a good benefit. And then uh, there is a module called Drupal Image Optimize. In Drupal 7, it was Image API Optimize. Um, this is a great tool that allows you to use the Image Magic um, Image Processing Library rather than the GD Image Processing Library that comes with Drupal Core. And the Image Magic uh, Processing Library is an open source library that allows you to do so much more. So you can really get in there and do some <coughs> fine grain optimization of your images. So get into architecture. Is your site easily crawlable? So Google has a bot that will come to your site starting on a page that has either was linked to from somewhere else or coming from your site map submission um, or just your homepage because it knows it exists. Um, you want to have a well thought out keyboard navigable menu. So um, no fancy JavaScript that stops a keyboard crawler because your, your bots don't always navigate JavaScript correctly. Um, so basically if you can tab through just like you're in your accessibility check, um, that's what Google Bot's going to do. Um, and again, you know, outlining the structure of the site. Um, breadcrumbs marked up with schema.org uh, markup, you, whether that be in JSON LD or in uh, the template files themselves. But if you define these breadcrumbs as breadcrumbs using schema, um, Google will know and be able to follow that structure. Uh, I like the Drupal sitemap module. This creates an HTML sitemap um, based on the Drupal 8 version uh, has uh, a menu, a RSS feed, but basically you can create on a page another crawlable uh, menu or sitemap that users can use if they want to quickly look over your, your site and then Google can also crawl also. Uh, it's good to just link that from your footer. Um, the Drupal XML sitemap module was the go-to in Drupal 7. Uh, in Drupal 8, I've been using the simple XML sitemap menu. Uh, it fixes one thing with uh, href lang on sitemaps, the language of sitemaps, um, and also actually works, whereas the Drupal 8 version of the XML sitemap module, I haven't gotten it to work right. So there's still uh, activity, people working on that. Um, so I may come back to it. It was a really powerful tool, but for now, the simple XML sitemap module works great. Are you, are you only saying we should choose one or the other? Yeah, you basically you want to have one one sitemap uh, submitted. Um, and you prefer the HTML? I, no, uh, the HTML and the XML sitemaps, those are two different things. So the HTML sitemap helps you create a page that has a uh, visual sitemap on it, let's say. The other one's a reference only. Yeah, the other one is, outputs XML, which is just data, and you can use that to submit to Google Search Console and get them to crawl based on that. Uh, you can set priorities in there. Um, everybody's used the Drupal Path Auto module before. Um, this helps you set URL structure. Um, based on you know your menu system. I always use a menu token to say where it's in the menu. You can have that uh, follow your friendly URL structure. Um, has anybody here ever crawled one of their sites? Um, I use a tool called Screaming Frog SEO Spider, um, which uh, ha they have a free version. It'll let you crawl uh, 5,000 uh, links or so. Um, it is really interesting to see what you have actually created as a site creator. Um, there are things you definitely won't know about. There are things that come out of the box in Drupal and WordPress that say, oh, I didn't know I had media URLs for my media things that accidentally got linked to. 
Um, here's what that looks like. You know, I just threw in my own personal domain, um, and it's a really powerful tool. It gives you all of the links that you crawled, both internal and external. Um, it gives you reports, page titles, um, how many are over 65 characters, how many are duplicate. I have a thousand duplicate page titles. Yeah, something's not right there. Um, missing 988 meta descriptions. Ooh. Um, so you can use this to actually see what your site has created and then come in here and fix things. Um, how many 404s do I have? Oh, I've, I'm linking to a couple places over here that don't exist anymore. Um, you want to pay attention to 301 redirects. Um, every step away from that the Google spider has to take, there's another step away from actually crawling your good content. Um, so crawling your site is a great way to gain insight into what you have done and what you can fix. Does the site work on mobile? So this is a big thing for 2017 and now 2018. Um, everybody here, I, I'm assuming, is using a responsive theme. Um, just because you use a responsive theme doesn't mean it passes Google's test of does it work on mobile. So use the Google mobile friendly test. Um, pop it open, stick your URL in here. It will tell you if you can pass their, their qualifications. Um, and don't just do the home page, do a bunch of pages. Do your home page, your category page, a blog page, your article page, your product page. Um, you know, make sure you're, all of your templates work there. Um, here's the AMP. Uh, Drupal has a AMP module. Uh, basically, it creates another view of your content that uses AMP markup. Um, if this is a road you want to go down, it's a kind of intensive um, restructuring of your site. So basically, you're using Drupal or Google's AMP markup to present another view of what you have already presented in your theme. So you're basically re-theming your site a second time. Um, but it's in a lot of people's strategy. Good for articles and blog posts. Um, not so great with products and rich media sites. Um, another thing under architecture is no duplicate content. So again, we do not want to split our uh, link equity between two URLs. Um, the redirect module uh, should be on every site by default. If you change a URL, it automatically updates. Um, in the meta tag module, you can use tokens to set the canonical URL of a page. So if it does get copied or printed out somewhere else, uh, we will know that that's the canonical URL. And then there are certain pages that you're going to want to have no indexed. Um, so you can use the meta tag module to set the robots meta tag. No index means I don't want this page in Google. Um, no follow means don't follow any links here. So I could have like a category page or a paginated page that says don't index this page, but follow all the links. So if I have my blog has you know 20 pages on it I want Google to follow all the way through but I don't want those actually paginated pages all 20 of those pages I don't need those in Google I just want my main page and then the actual all the, of the articles so that would save me on some crawl budget and keep my site nice and clean in Google's index does the site load quickly um, this is a big push from Google uh, and in Drupal, we have so many different types of caching. Uh, we can cache inside of Drupal. We can cache our blocks and our views and our panel panes and our whole page. And we can use CDNs on our hosts. Um, Drupal has an awesome module called ADVAG, Advanced Aggregation, or Drupal Advanced CSS and JavaScript Aggregation Module. It is a really hard module. Um, it, goes in and basically restructures the way Drupal works to load CSS and JavaScript at the end of your page load, defers things. Um, but the creators has made an awesome tutorial called Get 100 on PageSpeed Insights uh, on groups.drupal.org. So you can follow step by step in how to implement it, which 
it's worth the effort if you can do it. I just did it, I shaved a couple seconds off of one of my clients' say, page loads. Uh, and then CDNs, uh, Cloudflare is a great uh, free CDN. If you host on Pantheon, uh, they use Fastly as their uh, CDN. There's a bunch of other ones in there. Basically, a CDN is a content delivery network. So basically, I'm caching a page on a server in Europe, and that gets served to my Europe European visitors, and uh, San Francisco gets over here, and Chicago here, and New York here. So basically, it takes your page loads off of your server, off of your site, puts it closer to uh, the users on fast servers, and you know Google will benefit you of that. And your users will love it too. Um, and then responsive images, small images, you know, images are going to be a bulk of your page load. Um, you know, make sure they're as small as can be for the screen you're delivering it to, uh, and you can do that in image presets. Okay, so architecture. Does this site contain keywords in the URL? Again, we'll, we'll go back to the path auto module. Um, set default patterns for all your content types. That's easy. We usually do that out of the box. Uh, configure the global settings. Uh, there are stock words you can remove. Um, to me, uh, Drupal's default of 100 characters is a little long. I usually shorten that up to 80 or 60. Um, and then I always train content editors to manually configure it too. Um, it's one thing to set it and forget it, and you know it does pretty good. But if you show your content editors that a short keyword concise URL is better for a user to visit, uh, better for Google to crawl, um, you know some pay attention to that and can actually go in and configure their own short URLs. Is the site secure? Um, Every site that starts out from now on, and I'm sure you've heard in other uh, sessions, you need to be HTTPS. Um, it's just, that should be the default. You can get free SSL certificates from Let's Encrypt. Um, if you use Cloudflare, they give you a free uh, SSL certificate. It doesn't have a huge cost anymore. And uh, security is, uh, you know, just should be standard from now on. Uh, Keep core, Drupal core, and modules up to date. Uh, goes without saying. Uh, if you're responsible for the server that the site is host on, that means you're responsible for the server security also. You should limit server access and keep those server modules and server things up to date also. Um, that's why I like managed hosting, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, and then require strong passwords. You know, the, the weakest link of most sites is that you can just use a password attack, and I'm sure you, we've seen it on every site we have. If you look at the logs, you know, if URLs are constantly barraged, you know, for most of my Drupal sites, people try to log in at WP Admin, you know, thinking that it's a WordPress site. It's not thinking at all. It's just these bots that are constantly trying to hack your site using bad passwords. Um, Drupal password policy module allows you as an administrator to s define rules that your admins or your users will have to follow. Negative factors in architecture is cloaking. Uh, this was what they called black hat SEO back in the day, um, where you would have Googlebot come and crawl your site, and then you'd use JavaScript or something else to show completely different uh, content to users, uh, human users. Uh, Google can figure that out, or if you outsmarted them today, you know, tomorrow they'll figure out how you did it and block you and kick you out of the index. Um, does the page title contain the keywords? Uh, again, using the meta tag module and token, you can basically apply your uh, title of your node to the page title of the HTML. Does the meta description describe the page? Um, this is one that Drupal doesn't do well out of the box. Uh, out of the box, it has no summary, right? So if you have a body field, it's going to truncate the first 150 characters or so and put that as the meta tag by default. Um, I always add a teaser field to uh, every content type I create. 
uh, and I explain to my creator, uh, content creators, and I give a nice description there, that this field should be used to describe the content of the page. It's another way to get them to think about their content. Um, this field does not have to be used on the page at all. It can just, the token from this field can be used to set the meta description, the open graph description, the Twitter card description. Um, so it could only be used offsite or it could be used on the page too. Um, I do the same thing for a featured image field. Um, again, can be used in the display if you put it, you can put a nice hero at the top of your page, but also it doesn't need to be used in the display, so you could use it as a marketing piece. So, you know, a lot of times now if you see a page shared on Twitter or Facebook, it has marketing copy inside the image. You know, you can have your content creators not only pay, create content for the page itself, but you could also have them create it for how it's displayed on Facebook, how it's displayed on Twitter. You could go as hog wild as you want with this. You could have one for Twitter, one for uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, you know, the sky is the limit. Here's what that looks like. So the first, uh, basically I use field group in my uh, admin screens. And the first screen is simply title, teaser, featured image. Yeah, go on to the next tab and then you can actually work on your content. You can make these fields required if you so choose or not. Um, does the site use structured data? So here is the schema.org markup um, put into a template. Um, so this is the old way of adding schema. Um, you do item scope in a div or another HTML element and then which type. So that type is schema.org broadcast service. So this is a television station. Inside there's properties. So properties of this item, the name, the display name, uh, video format, you know, these are basically specific to the broadcast service type. And then uh, schemas can be nested. So the last one on the page here is the broadcast affiliate of, um, and that is affiliate of ABC. So we have another item prop and item scope and it goes off the screen here, but the item type is organization. Um, so schemas can be nested inside of each other. What is more commonly used these days is the JSON LD version. So at the top I say the context is schema and then the at type is that broadcast service and then you get the same fields all the way down. Um, JSON LD can be inserted using Google Tag Manager. So it could be completely separate from your Drupal installation. Your SEO company could be injecting this into your pages already. Um, but thanks to the awesome Drupal schema.org meta tag module. You can now use tokens to set this itself. So basically, um, Karen S. from Lullabot and Damian McKenna, the maintainer of meta tag, have extended meta tag to actually implement uh, JSON LD using token in the same way we've configured meta tag. So right now they have one main module and then a bunch of sub-modules. So you can do article, organization, person, video, image, event, recipe, product, service, website, web page, item list for your views, and breadcrumb list for your breadcrumbs. So all of this can be set up, you know, just like you'd set up meta tags. And uh, you start ranking better in Google. Um, every site should use at least some schema. Uh, that website, the, everybody's making websites, the website is, has that site search. Um, most websites will have an organization. Uh, if you have an About Us page or a team page, breadcrumb list, uh, site navigation elements, you can have your site nav in there. Uh, videos, if you do videos and images. Um, and then those specific content ones from the Google search features that I showed earlier. 
Um, another structured data is the Open Graph protocol. This is what you know gets pulled if you share on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, there's also a link to Facebook debugger on this page. If you ever share something on Facebook and have a typo or anything like that, you can actually get Facebook to clear their cache. Same for Twitter cards. Twitter had their own uh, meta tag that they came up with. Um, Twitter card, Twitter site, Twitter URL, um, and they have a Twitter card validator there too. Uh, AMP, we talked about that. Proper use of headers. Proper ordered use of H1s, H2s, and H3s. Um, what's good for accessibility is also good for SEO. You do not want to skip tags just because it's a visual element. So, you know, you want if you have an H1, the next thing should be an H2. Under an H2, you should have H3. You should never go straight to an H4. Um, eight heading tags define the structure of your piece of content. It should keep like a table of contents. You don't want to jump down to an H5. Um, if you do need a different visual styling, come up with different classes that can uh, do that. Um, remove the H1 from the WYSIWYG. Uh, this can be done with uh, allowed uh, HTML filter. Um, basically, you can put everything in there, but the H1, it'll magically disappear. So easy in Drupal 8. Um, because we're using our template to define the H1, you don't want to allow your users to, you know, just because they want some big text, you know, ruin what this page is about. Um, Drupal by default comes uh, with H3s as its block headers. Um, they did this by default um, because H1s and H2 were reserved for the body, and then if you look at a Drupal 8 out of the box, your blocks on the sides are H3. Threes. So it is the third most important thing, you know, when you come out with Drupal out of the box. But when you start putting content in, um, I don't use that at all. I'd rather keep the H3s for the content creators. Uh, and then the negative factor, don't overuse keywords uh, just for the search engines. Don't stuff it in there because you need to have Drupal SEO, 7% of the words on the page, Drupal SEO, Drupal SEO, you know, it's, it's annoying and Google can figure it out. And then don't use CSS or JavaScript to hide words you want to be ranked for. Again, uh, Google's smarter than me, and don't do that. OK, uh, offsite factors. Is this domain trusted? Uh, that's usually external links linking to you. Uh, is it engageable? Uh, Google knows the bounce rate. So if they come to your site from Google and come right back, they know this page is not as good as it can be. Um, has the domain site been around? Um, negative factors are, has it been flagged for pirated content, or if it has too many ads above the fold? Offsite factors, the biggest one is links. Quality of links. Each link is graded on where it came from, quality of that domain, what keywords are in the URL, where it's in the page. Is a footer link more valuable than a top of the page link? Uh, keywords and link. Quantity. How many links does your piece of content need? It needs one more than your competitor. So you don't need to go crazy, but uh, link building is a thing, and getting links to your content is a whole other story. Uh, but don't buy them. Uh, and then don't allow comment or forum spam. So if you allow a Drupal comment system, you need to moderate it. Uh, I personally don't want that hassle on any of my sites. I use a service like Discus or Facebook commenting or somebody else to manage that. Um, Offsite factors, personal. Uh, these are factors we really don't have control in, uh, but is the same country as a searcher, the same city or town, uh, has the user ever visited the site before? Has the site been shared in circles of Facebook in those graphs? Um, actually, if you use a CDN, uh, the site will be in your, at least your country, maybe not the same city and town, uh, but that would be a benefit there. Uh, is your site respected on social network and does it have content shares? <coughs> And here comes a big, massive list of tools. So people are responsible for content. 
you want to research, you want to create and analyze, and then you want to report and refine. Uh, so a big list of tools to analyze, uh, AREF, uh, key, a Google Keyword Ad Planner, uh, if you want to buy ads, it's a great tool, but if you want to research what people are buying ads, um, services like Longtail Bro, Moz Keyword Explorer, Search Matrix uh, Essentials, SEO Quake has a browser plugin, uh, and then SpyFu is another one that basically goes and crawls Google ads, Google results for their ads to see what competitors are buying ads for. Um, more competitor in topic analysis. Uh, Alexa's been around forever. Uh, basically, it ranks websites on presence and visits and that kind of thing. Um, Buzzsumo, iSpionage, and Majestic. Uh, basically, these are all tools that we can get in and dig into certain topics or put your competitive competitor's URL in there, see what they rank for, all that good stuff. Um, at the bottom, there's a link to an article uh, um, this guy Robbie Richards interviewed 143 SEO experts to see which tools they use. It's a good skim. Um, to analyze your content, uh, there's a module called the Real-Time SEO for Drupal module. It's based on the Yoast JavaScript library, uh, which is Yoast is the most popular WordPress plugin. So on the fly, it analyzes your content um, against the topic keyword you want. It gives you a green light, yellow light, red light. Um, basically advises you on your build, building. I don't personally like this for Drupal because Drupal is more than just a body field, right? We use blocks and paragraphs and it's the output of the page. Um, so that's why tools like Search Metrics Essential and Moz are better because they can analyze URLs. Uh, however, uh, there is work in the real-time SEO for Drupal community to make it do the output, uh, to basically use the preview function of Drupal uh, and analyze that. Um, so keep an eye on that. Uh, terribly awful tools if you uh, are a writer, uh, readability score and readability analyzer, you can put in your words there and they can tell you how awful a writer you are. Um, it's scary. Um, and then uh, search metric content, search metrics content experience, uh, basically just like the Yoast tool, you write inside this tool and at least it analyzes your words. Uh, to report and refine, uh, Google Analytics. This is how uh, users act on your site. Google Search Console. This is how your site, your pages behave in Google Search. Uh, Matomo, which is formerly Pewik. This is an open source uh, analytics suite. So basically you set up your own uh, analytics server and your sites can report back to you. So if you're, one of your clients doesn't want to use Google Analytics, uh, Matomo, formerly Pewik, is a really cool, powerful tool. And then just like Google Search Console, Bing, Bing Webmaster Tools will give you uh, your content, how you behave inside Bing search results. For developers, um, I've linked a bunch to Google documentation. Google has crazy awesome tools. Um, if you're making schema.org, test it. Uh, Google Structured Data Testing Tool um, will analyze what you've created and output it. Uh, the Structured Data Markup Helper, if you have content, you can put your content in there and it will help you build a schema. Uh, Google Page Speed Insights, this is how fast your page is, the mobile friendly test, shows you if you're mobile friendly or not. If you're doing uh, email, you can help make uh, email schema markup and test that. Uh, Search Console, if you're making AMP, they have an AMP test. Uh, and then Google Lighthouse. Google Lighthouse is the most powerful tool Google's come out with yet. Um, it's built into Chrome, so you can actually open up Chrome Inspector and under audits, click a button and do an audit of a, a certain URL. Um, it has a browser plugin and a Chrome extension. Um, let's see here. I ran a report on DrupalNewJerseyCamp.org before and it came out with, you know, look at all that green. They did great tests. So it groups your tests and your audits into performance, accessibility, best practices, and SEO. Um, 
gives you images, what it takes to render. So basically, you know, from 2.5 seconds, that was the time to first paint. 12.7 uh, seconds for a full render. Um, you know, gives you tips on how to improve on performance, what you're missing on being a progressive web app, accessibility, best practices, or SEO. Um, really powerful tool to dig into. Um, to do it, basically, here I'll do it to them, basically inspect, open up your inspector, go to audits, bang, right there. Click a button, it'll start working right away. Um, also available for, as a command line tool, um, and the output of this is actually saved in JSON, um, so you can have your DevOps team build it into all sorts of their crazy uh, testing apparatuses and all that fun stuff. Uh, and then the biggest one at the bottom, web page test, that's another speed tool, it's really powerful. Um, gives you a lot of data about your full network, you know, what it takes to fully render your page, where it's coming from, you can test from different locations. Um, Google has what they call search quality raters. Um, they contract with 10,000 people across the US, or across the world um, who evaluated search results. Um, they have no actual bearing on the rankings, but they're basically validating Google's search results. Um, they've been doing this for a long time. They used to have a PDF that was <coughs> silently leaked by somebody in Google. Um, recently, uh, they've updated their publishing guidelines and they actually released this to us. So if you want to read what a Google search quality rater what their job title or the job description is. Um, this PDF exists. So you can go through and see what they're looking for and how they qualify uh, results that they see. Um, and then of course, they, you know, if they don't find something wrong, everything's okay. If they do find something wrong, that's brought up with the search team and maybe they'll change their algorithm around it. So uh, kind of a stiff read, but uh, pretty interesting stuff. Um, some of you went to Ben's uh, training session yesterday. The Drupal 8 SEO book um, is a great step-by-step -step guide. You know, you're starting fresh. Here's all the modules to um, install, how to configure them. Definitely gives you the basics about what Drupal core and the contrib modules can do and how to configure them pretty easily and uh, really good stuff. And then uh, I had met him at a couple camps before and last year we were talking like oh well your book you click everything in the ui what if we could do this with config um so that got me thinking i started playing around with uh, a module drupal seo starter is what i called it um, and basically after following most of his steps um, i saved the config and made a module that basically you install this it you know does a whole bunch of stuff for you like configure breadcrumbs, adds Google Analytics, set some default meta tags, do, does some default path auto patterns. Um, so I shared that module. A couple people have used it. I've used it on a couple starter sites. So if you want to check that out. Um, Jim, where do you get all this information? OK, here, I got it all from these people. Uh, I follow Search Engine Land, Search Engine Journal, Moz Blog, Search Metric Blog. The Google Webmaster Central blog is amazing. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I share a million articles and cat photos um, and Drupal Camp stuff. Um, and that's it. Um, if you have any questions, let me know or uh, ask me later or anything. I usually talk too much and everybody's just like, okay, can we go now? I'm so angry there. Um, vacation? I really wanted to get back to work. <laughs> well, thank you. All right, thank you.